again, it just goes to show once again that no one, not the pollsters, not the pundits, not the TV anchors, not even the candidates themselves, can really ever understand what is in the hearts and minds of voters until the moment they vote and their ballots are counted, what matters to them and what doesn't. And that moment of clarity is right now. Because last night, contrary to what many people were led to believe, Americans across the country propelled Democrats to what may have been the most consequential political achievement for the Democratic Party since the day Joe Biden was elected. Voters injected rocket fuel directly into the party's bloodstream, electing Democratic candidates and advancing a number of their key policy positions. In Kentucky, a governor's race once projected to be a very close one was not. Incumbent Democrat Andy Bashir won a second term by a six-point margin, a wider one than his last time around, in a state that Donald Trump won by 26 points. In Virginia, NBC News projects Democrats retained control of the state Senate and actually flipped its House of Delegates. So now Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin, he's the best guy, the conservative poster boy generating national buzz, will wrestle with two chambers controlled by the Democratic Party over matters of gun safety, voting rights, and the issue that define that race and others, reproductive freedom. Nowhere was that more pronounced than in the state of Ohio. In one of the most watched contents, contests in recent memory, voters there enshrined abortion rights in their state constitution, and they did so by a margin of 12 points. This was the second election day since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, and both times the issue of abortion was one of, if not the primary driver of how voters would behave at the polls. It's a huge loser for Republicans, one they can't do much about, and one they have just one guy to blame. Guess who? The man who's publicly reveled in the idea that he is the one responsible for striking down Roe, Donald Trump. So after the American people were so unambiguous yesterday on the issues that matter to them, do Republicans have it in them in 2023 to course correct in time for 2024? Or will Americans see in Donald Trump what they saw in the rest of the Republican Party? A man and a party woefully out of step and out of touch. That's where we start today with some of our favorite friends. Former Congressman from Florida, David Jolly, is back with us. Here with me on set for the hour, former Senator from Missouri, Claire McCaskill. Political strategist Matt Dowd joins us as well. Lucky for us, they're all MSNBC contributors. Matt Dowd, there was a nostalgia to you texting me while I was doing... Um, baseball practice pick up and <laughs> tell me what the polls said and what was going to happen. Um, take all of our viewers inside what you were seeing in the exit polls and the returns. Well, when I looked at, thank you, Nicole, when I looked at what you, I mean, you know, I've, I'm sort of a mad scientist in these things on election night as you've been there on this stuff. And I think too often people sort of focus on the wrong things. And on election night, what I was looking at was the difference between in Kentucky, for example, and why I knew early on, early, early on that Bashir, and I texted you early on that Bashir was going to win, was because he was performing in county after county after county five to six points better than he did when he barely won in 2019. And sort of that, if, if and that I think was holding pattern all along, and that was going to hold pattern, and he ended up winning by five points, five points better than he, than he did last time. To me, this is such a fundamental first, a fundamental sort of thing that, that there's such a misunderstanding into of today's electorate. They People constantly look at the wrong numbers in polls and not at the right numbers, which is why they miscalculated in 2022 of what was going to happen, why they miscalculated in 2023, because there's a huge divergence between what people sort of are, what they look at on paper and what actually has, ha happens on the playing field. To me, politics is a lot like an NFL game or a college football game is you don't win the game or lose the game on paper. You win or lose the game in the field. And in the last five elections in the field, when there's candidate against candidate, message against message, the Democrats have won. And I would say this is becoming fundamentally less, I would argue, less about Donald Trump and more about what the Republican Party has become. And so I know you premised that they only have Donald Trump to blame because of what he did with Roe versus Wade. But in my view, they only have themselves to blame because they've allowed this to happen. They've allowed the Republican Party to become this, carry all these things that a majority of Americans can't stand. And now they present candidates who, who don't fit the electorate, as we saw last night in Virginia, um, and issues that don't fit the electorate, as in Ohio, 
and the candidates in Kentucky. And so to me, this has become a sort of virus that now patient zero is, I think it doesn't matter as much, but the virus has attached itself to the Republican party. And that's what I don't think people fundamentally understand. This is a virus, the American people, when they have come down to it in the field of battle on election day, make a comparison and they vote democratic. I want to press you on something, um, and I and I um, I so love being not corrected, but being but being enlightened by your understanding of the electorate because your record um, is pretty close to perfect, Matt Dowd. What strikes me as broken is describing the country as divided around issues. They are not. 85% of all Americans believe that abortion should be legal in certain or all circumstances. 85% of all Americans support gun safety legislation, a whole slew of specific policies that we put up on the screen all the time. What is divided, what is polarized is tribalism around extremist views that really aren't even rooted in ideology, but they have done damage to President Joe Biden's approval rating. And I wonder, Matt Dowd, what you make of, of the Ohio exits that show President Biden sitting at about 41 percent, but support for abortion access at 60 percent. That is Joe Biden's position and Joe Biden's position only. Donald Trump is responsible for the extremism that has been ushered in on the right. What does Joe Biden do with that 20 points sort of running room or headroom between his own approval and the support for his position on reproductive health care? So I'm really glad you asked this question. And perfect, perfect, I think, question is, is we saw in 2022, in any sort of what people understood as normal, is where, where Biden's approval rating wasn't very good going into a midterm election that usually aren't very good. But what ended up happening is Democrats in state after state after state won among people, overwhelmingly among people that somewhat disapproved of Joe Biden. Yesterday's electorate, people that wanted abortion, uh, health care freedom, among people that somewhat disapproved of Joe Biden voted overwhelmingly for that amendment. This is why this sort of this idea of predicting what's going to happen with Joe Biden from polls today, when voters today or yesterday were focused on those elections and what was the choice in those elections. Come next year, seven, eight months from now, the choice is going to be very clear for voters. And though they may dislike Joe Biden in this, in some ways, in things that he's done or who he is and all of that, they're going to have a fundamental choice. And as you said, in, in issue after issue after issue, and really fundamentally in vision of the country, if you just present it as a vision of the country, the Democrats, Democrats' vision of the country of pro-freedom, pro-justice, uh, you know, pro-multicultural uh, democracy is much more supported than what the Republicans' vision is, which is a one-culture the single thing. And as you, I don't know if you saw yesterday that you had Senator Santorum on Fox News yesterday, basically saying we have to get rid of these things where you vote on the ballot, basically saying democracy doesn't work for us because if we give voters the choice on issues, they have a tendency almost in every single instance. And as Claire knows, even in red Missouri, they voted, they put how they put the rising uh, minimum wage on the ballot. It passed. They put expansion of Medicare on the ballot. It passed. And so that's what I think Republicans don't want is sort of voters actually coming to the conclusion what candidate fits them in, in many ways. And I think in the end, Joe Biden is a candidacy is going to fit where voters are, even if they dislike him at the time and what issue fits them. And I think that's what we have to focus on, not these overall numbers that people sort of keep set, saying a year out from the election day, but where are voters fundamentally, fundamentally in the choice they have to make? Claire, you were focused on Virginia. Um, I think fair to say a little worried that, that um, Youngkin's position um, might sound acceptable when held up against the really extreme positions um, among some of the Republicans. Democrats prevailed across the board in Virginia. Are you surprised, heartened, cautiously optimistic? Well, Tell me I, your reaction. I hope some of my children are watching because they always say they don't get to hear me say this often enough. I was wrong. You were wrong. You were right to be worried. I think we're all, I think, I, here's the thing. I think we're all worried. I'm, I'm worried every election night. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think that what Youngkin did has worked before, right? The Republican Party is so wackadoo that if you take an inch step to the left of the extremists, you can be perceived as moderate. That he didn't is is reassuring, I think, right? It is reassuring. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a couple of things that really matter in 2024. One is motivation. 
Yeah. And, you know, these men who, and, and with all due respect to my friends that are with me on this <laughs> panel right now, but I was reading this morning in, in the Wall Street Journal, some political consultant from Virginia, and he was opining that this issue would fade by November of 2024. <laughs> I got news for him. This issue is not going anywhere. Women are angry. This is about their freedom. This is about their health. This is about whether or not they can make decisions with their family and with their doctor on monumental things in their lives. And I don't think men, many men, some do, but many don't fully understand what a gut punch the Dobbs decision was to women. And it is not going away.